Skirlek, iki le tlhagele la kwa setlhoeng sa bobega khang ka 2009. Morago ga gore mosimenyana wa Mosweu Johan Nel, a thuntsa ka ke a sa tlhaole kwa lefelo leo, le go bolaya batho ba le bane, miatlogela ba bangwe ka dikgobalo. Mokhudu tsa maga wa lefapha la Human Settlements, Public Safety and Liaison des Bomohono. O la etse masipala wa selegae wa Khetlen Refir, go netefatsa fa lefelo leo le phatlhala tsa go tlhelele, gore ba agi bangwe ba se ipe e gape mogolona. Mothapi Mudise, Northwest FM News, Rustenburg. Johannesburg, Joburg. Now, without going back to Deep Slut, where I have been staying in the past year to take my toothbrush or any of my belongings, I come straight here to the hiking spot with no other thought crossing my mind except those of my family back home in Skirlek. And my shirk. My blue painted shack. I start to hike. I keep on hiking and hiking and hiking and hiking and hiking until when this white bucket stops. I tell the man where I'm going. He says to me, hop in. Yes, I jump on the back of this bucket with no canopy and then we start to go. We keep on going and keep on going and keep on going and going and going. Now I'm sitting at the back of this bag with no canopy. I'm being hit by this wind. It's cold, rough, shrewd. It bites, but we just keep on going and going and going and going past Kruger's Dorp. We keep on going and going and going and going and going past this supermarket in the middle of nowhere by the junction with the road going to Fenestop. We just keep on going and going with the R24 and keep on going and going and going and going. We come across the N14 with the road sign again saying Fenestop to the left and to the right. I don't remember the other place to the right, but we just keep on going and keep on going and going and going and going and going. But as we go, I start to realize Realize that the road we just passed back there saying Fenner's Dorp to the left, it's actually the quickest way back home. Now I'm starting to feel impatient. I can't help it but feel that this buck is not going fast enough. I'm getting tired of sitting at the back here, but luckily there in front there is Machalisberg. Now when we get in Machalisberg, I relax, take a pee, get some water, and then back on the road. We just keep on going and keep on going and going and going and going and going on this road that curves to the left and then to the right and then to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right and then we start to go up this hill and up and up and We go past this old man by the side of the road, 
selling flowers. Those beautiful, colorful, little, cute flowers will just keep on going and keep on going and going and going and going past Rustenberg. We keep on going and going and going and going. But this time I'm very careful because in about 15 kilometers or so, just before you could enter Swartrechens, there's a small road to my left. Route 501. You will notice it by the graveyards on the other side. I get off and I start to walk. I am walking back home to Skirlik. Home is about 10 kilometers or so from here. I did not even bother myself by trying to hike back at the corner because I know I'll hardly see a car going along this road, so I just keep on walking and walking and walking. But as I walk, I am getting locked up in my own mind. Deep in my own thoughts, I start to realize things. I start to realize things that I have never realized before about this place that I call home. Skirlek. Like the fact that Skirlek is a brand. Yes, Skirlek is a brand. Skirlek is a brand like Sowetan, Sunday Sun, Daily Sun, Mandela. Yes. Come on, Mandela is a brand. You know, something small happens to Mandela, or a Mandela papers are sold. Shelves, clean, school. Yes, like last year, two years back, the Sunday Sun said that the SABC was rehearsing the broadcasting of Mandela's funeral in case he dies. <laughs> now ask yourself, why not my funeral? I mean, why not your funeral? Why, why, why not some witch from Limpopo's funeral? Because you are not brands. I mean, imagine that I die and someone writes about me in the newspaper with the headline saying, Thomas is dead! Uh, yeah, no one is going to buy that paper. People are going to ask, and who the fuck is Thomas? Oh, that boy who ran away from Skirlek to go and sell papers in Johannesburg. So what? People die all the time. We don't want to read about him. He is not Mandela, he is not the Pope, he is not Michael Jackson, but if it's Mandela the Pope or Michael Jackson, people come in numbers from all corners of the world, but people are not going there to pay their last respects and mourn with the family. No, people are going there for themselves, for their own image's sake. People are going there so that they can one day say, I was there. Believe me, I am talking from experience. I have seen it all. Since three years back when I first left home, I have been sitting in that corner selling papers, selling people's miseries, people's tears, people's complaints, selling my home, selling Skirlek. My mind comes back and I just keep on walking and walking and walking and walking and as I walk there in front there towards my right, I start to see these houses, these Beautiful, colorful houses. This is Mazist. 
But I don't pay too much attention to it. I just keep on walking and walking and walking because here on my left is my home. Skirlek. Now, from where I'm standing over here, before I can even go far, I am struck by a smell. It's a unique kind of smell. I don't know what I can compare it to, but I'm sure that if poverty had a smell, it would probably smell like this. But I mean, that shouldn't come as a surprise if you're looking at this place. I mean, if you've been exposed to the, this place, if, if you've been exposed to the life here, if you're looking at this place, I mean, this place looks dodgy. It looks incomplete, scattered. It's like someone just came with pieces of corrugated iron sheets, mazenke, and just started throwing them around and throwing them around and around and around and around and around and around. But that too shouldn't come as a surprise if you know the history of this place, if you know how this place was born. Of course. I was still young then. But I do know that we were still staying in the Nell family farm when one night, while I was sleeping, my father, Johannes, came to wake me up from this deep sleep, telling me that we have to pack, we, we have to leave. Thomas Toha, Thomas Toha, help me pack this, help me pack that, help me pack this, help me pack that, and yes, I... <sighs> I wake up from this deep sleep. Well, a part of me is still asleep, though I walk towards the door to see what exactly is going on. And as I open the door, I stop, surprised, shocked. I don't know how to describe the feeling, to describe what I'm looking at. But it's dark. The moon is bright, but I tell you, the sun could have done a better job. I can't see clearly. I'm not sure who is who or where is who, but I can see Sis Lizzie over there. Yes, I can see Sis Lizzie over there wearing her white torn T-shirt. The one she always wakes up wearing in the morning. I'm starting to think that maybe it's her nightdress. Otherwise, people are breaking down their shacks. Very subtle, without the sound of the loud, irritating, corrugated iron sheets. And there's a group of kids over there. Yes, there's a group of kids over there under a tree. I still can't see who is who or what they are eating, but I can hear their tiny voices. Yes, I can hear their tiny voices having these childish, but mature conversations. Conversations that I believe they might have heard from their elders. Otherwise, people continue packing each and everything that belongs to them. All this I saw in a blink of an eye. And at that moment, I close the door back into the shack and then I start to help my father pack. I help my father pack this. I help my father pack that. I help my father pack this. I help my father pack that. I help my father pack this. I help my father pack that. But as I help my father pack, I'm still not sure why we are living, where we are going or why, but I help him anyway because he, is my father.
my father. My father was a very good man. Johannes, he was born in the farms and raised in the farms. I was raised by him. My mother died when I was young. A, a shell caught fire, I was told. Yeah, my father was a typical African man. He was a man who found it very hard to tell his son that he loves him. But growing up, I never needed to hear him say that. Because him waking up every morning, going to the fields and breaking his back just so I can have food on the table was love enough. He, he liked telling me stories. <laughs> he liked telling me stories. He always told me stories. Like this other time, he told me this other story from the Bible, from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 11, where Jesus Christ arrives in the small town of Nana. And as he arrives there, a widow's son had just passed away and was being carried out of this small town. And Jesus saw the widow. He had compassion on her. And he walks over to her and he says, do not weep. Then he turns to look at the, the bearers who were carrying the body of the young man who automatically stood still. He walks over to them and as he gets there, he walks around the body of the young man and then he says, young man, I say to you, arise. And the young man started to breathe. He started to cough. His eyes opened, he sat up straight and he started to speak and everyone was looking in disbelief. In disbelief towards this miracle that Jesus has just done. You see, I never forget that story. I never forget that story just because of the way my father used to tell it with so much disbelief in his own eyes. Otherwise, my father has told me many stories. <laughs> Some I can tell, maybe in time. But as soon as we were done packing each and everything that belonged to us, some families were already done and had already started embarking on this long journey ahead of us. We took everything that belonged to us and we joined them. We started to walk. We kept on walking and walking and walking and walking and walking. Now it's late at night, it's dark, it's quiet. People are locked up in their own minds, deep in their own thoughts. Some may be even counting the stars. It was only after we've went hill after hill in the field, exhausted by this long journey, that conversations started to erupt amongst us. It was like all this time we were running away from something and all of a sudden people felt safe and secure enough that they can start speaking. And that's when some people asked for a few seconds of rest. A few seconds that went into minutes. Minutes into hours and after a little while we all decided to join them and after another while we just decided, I fuck, eh, we will continue walking again tomorrow. 
thanks to the lazy and tired. We all took that rest. Until the following morning when I was woken up by this irritating sound of a nail being knocked through a corrugated iron sheet. Yes, some people had decided that they were going to build their shacks here in the middle of nowhere. And that's when we decided to join them. Yes, we, we started to build our shacks. Some started to build their shacks over that side, some their shacks that side, some over there. Some families were working together to share one shack and Mantiba's shack over that side. And me and my father, our blue painted shack over here. Now, this is the same shack. This is the same shack where I grew up to become a man. The same shack where I had some of the most happiest moments of my life. Now, after we built the shack, me and my father decided to take a very, very long rest and I go to sleep and we wake up the following morning and my father was still sleeping. So I go outside and I just see some people were still putting some finishing touches on their shacks. I just stand out here looking at them as they go up and down and up and down. Until like later in the day when I decided to go back into the shack and my father was still sleeping. I just stand here busy trying to wake him up, telling him, Papa, it's over. Papa. Tsura, Papa, Tsura, <laughs> Papa, Tsura. Papa, Tsura. Papa, Tsura. Papa, Tsuha, but he doesn't wake up. He is just sleeping here, so I quickly run outside. I tell the woman next door and the man next door, and they both come inside. And then they go outside. And they start to tell that one. That one calls that one, that one, that one, that one, this one, this one, that one. And all of a sudden, the whole community comes together. They they, they come into the shack. And they wrap my father up with a blanket. And we all carry him up to that hill. As the sun sets with the orange, amber-like color of the sun as it sets, hitting over our shakes down there. And as we laid him to rest, one old man amongst us said, yeah, it all happened.
happened so scarily. Yeah, scarily. Yeah, scarily. And scarily. That's how this place was born. Now, when we started to stay here in this place, no one cared about us. No one wanted to know about us. No community wanted to accept us. We just had to get on and carry on with our lives. Now, I'm still standing here looking at those closely cramped shacks over there. And in between those closely cramped shacks over there, I can see a passage. There's a very long, dark, dodgy looking passage created by the shacks. I go through the passage. I start to walk. And I keep on walking and walking and walking and walking. Now oh, it is dark here. I mean, I can hardly see what I'm stepping on, but I just keep on walking and walking and walking and walking because I know that there are rats here, many rats of skill going up and down. If you see one, kill it. I just keep on walking and walking and walking until when I reach for the end of the passage. Welcome to Skirlik. It's a bit hot here. A little bit dry, a bit dusty. A little bit of space, but hot and dry. Yeah, a little bit open. There, there, there are a couple of reds going up and down over there. And there's a group of dirty little kids of skill like playing over there in the middle of the street with a piece of a corrugated iron sheet. Strange toy, no? And that one, particular, he, he never smiles. There's noise coming from that side. That's at Mantiva's place. It's where everyone else here goes to drink beer and young women of skill like play cards and gamble with their child grant money. And, <laughs> and there's a toilet over there. Now, there's a story about that toilet. You see, that toilet is the only toilet here in Skirlek. And it has been here for all these years since people of Skirlek started to stay here in this place. And it's a pit toilet. Now, since it's the only toilet here in Skirlek and it has been here for all these years since people of Skirlek started to stay here in this place, yeah, it's now kind of like full with the yeah, so kids here are not allowed to use the toilet because their parents are scared that they might fall into there and yeah. So kids here are supposed to help themselves around past the shacks behind the bushes and trees that side. But there's a problem with that. It's that people here have chickens and chickens will go anywhere, past the shacks, past the railway line, behind the bushes and trees, just to get something to eat. But there's another problem on top of that problem. It's that people here are not vegetarians. 
they eat chicken. They love chicken. That's why it's called chicken. You, you did not hear that from me. I'm still standing here and the sky is obviously blue as usual. Just like my blue painted shack over there with a small window and a white curtain. Well, well no, it doesn't, doesn't look white anymore. It's more like dusty red to cream white now. So anyway, I start to walk towards that shack. And as I walk towards the shack, it feels awkward. It feels heavy. I mean, it has been almost three to four years since I left this place, but I just keep on walking, looking at that blue door, locked with a very, very big chain. I start to reach for the keys in my pocket. I find them. And as soon as I get there, I hold the lock. I put the key inside. It agrees. I twist. It opens. I take it slow as I open this old but squeaky door and... As soon as I go inside, it all comes back. It all comes back. I can still see it. I can still see Anna. I can see Elizabeth, the blood. I cannot forget it all comes back. I can still see that boy, that white boy wearing khaki clothes with a gun in his hand, emerging from the dust, and he is just shooting. He is just shooting and shooting and shooting, shouting, come eat, yellow bloody kafirs, come eat, yellow bloody kafirs, exal yellow dot mark, exal al mal dot mark, and here I am running back to my shack and I am shouting, Anna! Anna! Anna. Anna. Fourteen January two thousand and eight. It was just a normal day. You see, I come out of my shack, I sit out here, it's hot, a little bit dry, a bit dusty. My wife Anna and our daughter Elizabeth are inside the shack here. And uh, there's a group of dead little kids of skill like playing over there in the middle of the street. And that one, ticky line, smiling. There's a woman over there under a tree, another one is doing laundry. Some are in their shacks, busy with whatever that they normally do. <laughs> And, and there's a man in the toilet. Yes, there's a man in the toilet there. I can see his feet through the gap at the bottom of the toilet. Otherwise, there's noise coming from that side at Mantiva's place. That's where everyone else goes to drink beer and they're already drinking this early in the morning. Otherwise, nothing special about this day. I'm in the sky. It's obviously blue as usual. Nothing special at all. Until when we start to see that white bucky. That white bucky coming out of the road. It comes out of the road so fast it stops there, creating this loud noise and this huge, huge, Huge 
cloud of red dust. And then the kids playing, stop playing. The woman sitting down stands up. The one doing laundry stops. Those who are in the shacks come out. Some looking through their windows. The man in the toilet, he drops on his paper. I can see it through the gap at the bottom of the toilet. He opens the door, sticks his head out, and everyone from Mantiba's place comes running this side. And for a moment, the whole community remains standing still, waiting for the dust to settle. But from where I am standing over here, before the dust could even settle, I can see a boy. I can see a white boy wearing khaki clothes with a gun in his hand emerging from the dust and he is just shooting. He is just shooting and shooting and shooting, shouting, come eight, you la bloody kafirs. Come eight, you bloody kafirs. Excel, you la dot mark. Excel, all is dot mark. And here I am, running back to my shack. And I am shouting, Anna. 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 And here in my shack, on the floor, in a pool of blood, is my wife, Anna, and our daughter, Elizabeth. At this moment, it's quiet. It's cold. It feels like it's the moment when the soul departs from the body. You know that moment, that moment when you see a woman for the first time. And for some reason, you just love her. Love is in the air. That moment when you hold your newborn daughter in your hands and you feel like this is the best thing that ever happened to you. It's nice. It's full of life. But it's gone. It's cold. I mean, just a few months back, I held my newborn daughter in my hands. I looked into her brown little eyes and I believed that she can be anything she wants to be. Just two years back, I saw her mother for the first time and for some reason, I just loved her. I just knew that this was the one, this was the woman that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, but it's gone. It's cold. And then, 
I start to hear people talking from outside. I then realize that I'm not alone here. I can hear people, ambulances and police cars making noise from outside. So I quickly stand up with this blood on my hands. And for a moment, I can smell life in this blood, but I don't stop. I rush outside and as I get out, I stop, surprised, shocked by what I'm looking at. I mean, I can see the whole community standing still. The woman from next door on the ground crying, the man from next door standing tall, holding back his tears, old men and young women from Mantiba's place holding their children in their arms, and that one, Tiki line, just standing there. After this, I've never seen him smiling again, but I don't stop, no. I'm rushing towards those cars, those ambulances and police cars, and as I'm running there, I'm shouting, hey, la, hey, la, hey, to sang, on leba, to come on, on leba, to come on. And this man, this paramedic runs to me. He runs with me to my shack, but before he can go into the shack, he stops. Shocked by what he's looking at. But finally, he gathers the courage to move. He then rushes to hold Anna. Then he holds Elizabeth. Then he holds Anna. And I'm just standing here at the door. I'm looking at this man as he tries and tries and tries and tries until when he finally lets go. And he drops his head, shaking it. I turn to look at his colleague who's standing directly behind me because at this moment I refuse to understand what is going on. He quickly turns his face away from me and he starts to rush back towards those cars over there. And as he gets there, he talks to this other police officer who goes behind the van and then he gives him this silver thing wrapped up in his hands. He takes it and he starts to rush back towards me. He's rushing towards the shack. I mean, I'm still looking and I can, I, I don't understand what they were talking about. Like, but I could see from the hand gestures that they're talking about what happened in here. As he runs back, he stops before he could go into the shack. And then he drops his head. He still can look at me through the eye. He walks past me into my shack, and when he gets there, he gives the thing to the other man, and together yeah. they unwrap it. They put it on the floor. They take Anna's body, they... They put her inside. They take Elizabeth's body, they put them inside, they zip it up, and carry it with them as they walk out. And I'm still standing here at the door and as they walk out, this silver thing carrying their bodies brushes past my arm and for a moment, a part of me dies. It turns cold. I'm numb. Finally, I gather the courage to move. I start to move at a distance toward them when this other man comes to me with these many papers that I'm supposed to sign. 
I take these damn papers and I sign each and every one of them. I give them back to him. But before I can even go far, before I can get anywhere, there they are. They have already put their bodies in the car. They have closed the doors. They are closing themselves inside. They are starting engines and I'm just standing here looking at them as they go, leaving this trail of dust as they go. And for some reason, I just start to run behind them. I'm running behind them. I'm trying to stop them. I'm shouting, hey, la, hey, la, hey, among, wanna, hey, among, wait, but they are gone. And I'm standing here in the dust. I'm lost. I'm confused. I'm standing here asking myself questions. I'm asking myself, why? I mean, you are a paramedic. Yes, you are a paramedic. Your job is to save lives. You were supposed to give them their lives back. You were supposed to give them their lives back because they were not yet dead. No, they can't be. I could smell life in their blood. They were not. They can't be. It can't be. I'm standing here in the dust. I'm lost. I'm confused. I'm asking myself questions. I'm asking myself where? Where is that Jesus that my father taught me about? Why can't he come here? Why can't he come here and bring my loved ones back to life like he did for the widow in Nina? Why don't these miracles happen to us? Because if there's a right time for him to come back, it's now. And that's when we started to see those cars. Those ambulances and police cars. They are coming down here so fast, they stop there. I they, these, these cars, they stop there creating this loud noise and this huge cloud of red dust and then the doors open. And these many people with pens, papers, books and microphones, they come out and they start to walk around. They start to walk around and they are asking people questions. They are asking people questions. They are asking people questions. They come to me. They ask me questions. They go into my shack. They shift my things. They open my pots. They do whatever that they like and then they are gone. And the following day, we are in papers. We are in the news. People are reading about us. We are on TV. And that's when we started to see those other cars. Those many, many, many cars that we have never ever seen before here in Skirlek. They are coming down here so fast. These big black cars with blue lights creating this long trail of red dust. They stop there creating this loud noise and this huge, 
huge, huge, never ever seen before here in Skirlek, cloud of red dust and these big men wearing black suits with white shirts and red ties with bodyguards around them, they come out and they start to walk around, they go around, they are greeting people, they are greeting each and every one of us, each and every one of us, they come to me, they shake my hand with a smile as if everything is okay and then they start to gather people. They start to gather people, they call each and every one of us and the whole community is standing there. Looking at this man, standing up here with microphones, cameras and bodyguards around him and he is telling us that things are going to change here in Skirlak. Mm. Things are going to change here in Skirlak. We are going to bring your houses. We are going to bring your tar out. We are going to bring you running water. We are going to bring you toilets. We are going to bring you change because no one, and I mean no one is supposed to live like this in our country. We are going to bring you change. Change. change and I'm standing at the back there looking at this man saying all these things to us and I'm asking myself if this is supposed to replace my wife if this is supposed to replace my daughter if this is supposed to replace my family because if that is the case then I don't want it no I would rather stay in a shack with my family and be happy than stay in a house when my family is gone. I mean, where were they all this time? Did my wife and daughter have to die first for things to change here in Skirlak? Is this how God chose to bring change here in this place? Because if so, then God must take this change back to wherever it comes from. Because I want my family back. That's all I want. I want my family back. I mean, why them out of all these many children here in Skirlak with careless mothers who don't care about them? Why not one of them? Why? Why am I one and only? It all happened so Skirlak. Skirlak. They were the headlines. They were more important than the names of the newspapers. They shook the country, they brushed change to this place, but still no one cared about us. No, everyone who was here was here for themselves for their own image's sake, shame on them, because even during the funeral, it was still about them. Yes, they were the ones standing up there with microphones, cameras, and bodyguards around them, and the whole community looking up to them as if they are gods, making long speeches, repeating the same things one after the other, change this, change that, change this, change that, we are going to bring you this, we are going to bring you that, singing the same song of change as if it will bring back our loved ones. Why? Why can't they let us live our lives? Why can't they fuck off to wherever they came from? Because even at the graveside, it was still about them. Yes, it was packed. It was a political funeral. It was so packed. I couldn't even pour soil into the grave. I was seated at the back here with my little speech that I never even got to read. And they, men and women in suits, 
sitting in front there as if they are the ones mourning, and yet none of them said anything about the deceased. None of them said anything about a man's loss to his wife, his daughter, and his family. No, it was about the country. Our country this, our country that. Our country this, our country that. And I'm sitting at the back here asking myself, is this the funeral of the country? Or the funeral of our friends? our family members and our loved ones who died here in Skirlak. But no, they didn't care. All they could give me was food. The very same food that they didn't even eat. No. They left. Right after the funeral. They didn't even bother just to wash their hands. They were gone. And they never came back. And I don't want to see them again. I don't want to see them again here in Skirlak. All this SABC, this BBC, this radio, what, what, this TV, what, what. I don't want to see them again because they all left here with a story to sell to the world about how we have not changed. About how the young boy Nell is scared of the Swat Khafar. What Swat Khafar? What sort of when we have lost our family members? When we have lost our loved ones, when I have nothing. And yet, all I wanted was to pay my last respects. It was to say my last goodbye the way we normally do in our African cultures, like everyone else. I too wanted to stand by the grave, grab the soil, pour it in there and say, Robala kakakhi somukubu. But I couldn't. Because some people's speeches were more important than other people's speeches. And after all this happening here, I couldn't stay in this place anymore. I couldn't stay in this place anymore because this place is giving me nightmares. This place is giving me nightmares. I keep on seeing the same things, waking up every morning and looking at the same spot where my wife and daughter died. Just sitting there and praying that maybe this could just be a dream. Maybe this could just be a dream, going to sleep and hoping that maybe tomorrow when I wake up, just maybe when I wake up, I will wake up to Elizabeth crying and Anna asking me to help with the baby here and there. That would be nice. I couldn't stay in this place anymore because this place is giving me nightmares. I keep on seeing that boy. That white boy wearing khaki clothes with a gun in his hand, emerging from the dust, and he is just shooting. He is just shooting and shooting and shooting, shouting, come eight yellow bloody coffers. Come eight yellow bloody coffers. Excel yellow dot mark. Excel all my dot mark. Excel all is dot mark and here I am running back to my shack and I'm shouting, 
ಅನ್ನ 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 and yet this is the same boy this is the same boy who inflicted me with fear towards a white man this is the same boy the same boy who made me wish i had money to buy a gun so i can go and shoot those bloody whites this is the same boy the same boy who made us all in skirleg go and stand outside the maba to high court hold him placards chanting kill the bua kill the farmer claim of nikleni trunk to this is the same boy the same boy who made me stand in court and look at the judge as he raised his arm hold him back his tears and he hit on the table saying four life sentences and 68 years imprisonment and at this moment even when i even when i knew that this was never going to bring back my family i knew that finally justice was served i wanted nothing to do with this place I found myself walking into towns I never knew existed meeting people from all walks of life until when I found myself in Johannesburg by the corner of a street selling papers and this is the same corner this is the same corner where I opened a newspaper and it was talking about those RDP houses those are dp houses that took ages to come this is the same corner where i was sitting and listening to the radio and it was telling us that people of skirlek are supposed to move to mazista and skirlek is going to be crushed down but why i mean can they see what this place holds for us what this place means for us i mean the reason my shack remains standing here years after i left is because it means something to me it's 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 like a tomb yes the jesus the jesus christ tomb and i believe that one day they will come back Yes, one day they will come back they will come to stay with me i don't know after how long maybe after three days or three months or even 300 years but they will they will come back because i have been waiting i have been waiting and god knows i have been waiting but i hope he understands i hope he understands but now now that i'm here i will talk to them now that i'm here i will ask for their spirits to come with me to our new houses in mazista where they will rest in peace because they can't stay here anymore Now that I'm here I will ask for their spirits to come with me I will talk to them ಕರಾವಣ ಕುಬೋರಿ ನುಕಾಲ್ ನುಕಾ 
Anna, <laughs> Mawale na o kastoro ba le kaka kiso fa. Eh. Arjama. Hari. Wababona banana bali. Wababona banana bali ba perihu di sutu. Ba petuti ba di. Ba rebuta orena arutani tuki ingara tani laki ing. Yano. Artama, I have a moyawal in our castor of a lacaca. He's so far. 